Good morning. Very glad to be here from Joplin, Missouri, where there is not snow on the ground uh, this morning. Um, no, it's, it's a thrill to be here. Um, my wife and I have um, been married about 21 years now. We have three kids. Uh, we have a 17-year-old, a 16-year-old who just got her license, and um, a 12, soon-to-be 13-year-old. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about this morning is immediate and relevant for our own family as we try to figure out some of these things. But like you, I imagine, or like many of you, I should say, a uh, family of five getting together, getting, getting everything together to come to church on a sun Sunday morning, it can be fairly chaotic. It can be kind of crazy. And our goal a lot of Sunday mornings is to not be a second song family. You know what a second song family is, don't you? Okay, so we don't want to be a second song family. So a lot of Sundays we'll be, you know, hustling, trying to get to church, kind of a, getting to church out of this chaos. We'll sit down, get focused on worship. We'll sing that first song. Then we'll sing that second song. And, and at least where we go to church, about the middle of that second song... I will get an alert from my phone. 9.30 every Sunday morning, I get the same alert. Do you know what the alert is? It's my screen time report for the previous week. And it's always convicting. You know, one of the, one of the central purposes of worship, of coming together week after week after week, is what I call recalibration. To recenter us on the throne. Because there's a lot of things, right, in our, in our daily lives, there's a lot of things in our weeks that serve to get us out of calibration. And so we need this moment to come together as a church family and refocus on what matters and refocus on the throne of God. But then my moment of worship is interrupted with this moment of conviction where I look at my phone and I realize I spent almost an entire day in the last week staring at a glowing little toy in my hand. Is that really possible? Is it really possible that over the next 12 months, over the next year, that I might spend almost an entire month staring into this screen? How is that even possible? It's a moment of conviction every single week. Maybe it's a good thing that it happens at church. <clears throat> I also have this gnawing concern as I look at my screen time report. I wonder, how is that shaping me? How is that changing me? How is that discipling me into a particular kind of person? Spending all that time on my phone. You know, there's long been this, um, I guess it's an urban legend or whatever. Um, there's always been this kind of a assumption that married couples look similar to each other. Have you heard that before? That married couples kind of look like each other? Well, um, University of Michigan years ago wanted to put that to the test to find out if that was actually the case. And so what they did was they got a bunch of random pictures of, of couples and they put them on a table and they asked a group of students to try to match the spouses with each other based only on appearance. Okay? And so this is what they did. Now what they discovered was the couples that had been married less than seven years, these students were not very successful in actually matching them up together based only on appearance. But the couples that had been married over 25 years, the students were unbelievably successful in being able to match them together based only on appearance. So the conclusion from that exercise, from that experiment, is that the longer you're married to your spouse, the more you will physically start to look like your spouse. I know that's a little bit creepy. It's a little bit weird. You're looking at each other now. Really? Really? Um, there's a lot of theories about why this might be the case. Similar eating habits over time, similar exercise habits perhaps. 
But one of the theories that I kind of like is that it's, it's a facial mirroring theory, that the longer you're with a person, you kind of mirror their facial expressions. And over time, your face kind of freezes according to those facial expressions. And so you actually do start to look like each other because you're constantly reflecting each other. Now, what this demonstrates is actually a key discipleship principle, and it's going to be up on the screen. The principle is time plus proximity plus imitation lead to a shared resemblance. Time, proximity, imitation lead to a shared resemblance. The longer you're with someone or something, the more you are imitating them, the closer you are to them, the more you will start to look like them. It's a key principle of discipleship. And it's reflected, this principle of discipleship is reflected in the pages of Scripture. Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Jesus said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. In other words, following Jesus means imitating Jesus by taking up a cross daily. Now, we could spend a lot of time unpacking this particular verse, but one of the things that this verse surely means is that following Jesus is total and habitual. It means taking up a cross daily and following him, learning to imitate him in our lives. Paul reflects this same idea in his writings. In, uh, for instance, Ephesians chapter 4. Paul is, in, in this chapter in Ephesians, he's giving us all sorts of insights about what it means to live as a follower of Jesus. He's, he calls it living a life worthy of our calling. That's what he says in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 4. But he goes on in verse 22. Here's what he says. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Discipleship means taking off the old, putting on the new, becoming a new person. He summarizes this goal of discipleship in another place, in Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, unfortunately, we oftentimes stop reading after verse 28. You've, you may have heard that verse before. Certain things happen to us in our lives, good things, often bad things. These things happen to us in our lives. And the encouragement is that God is going to use those things for our good. Now, that's true, by the way. But we have to make sure that our definition of good is the same as God's definition of good. And Paul tells us that definition in the very next verse, verse 29. It says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. The goal of discipleship is that we grow into the likeness of Christ. We look more like Jesus in our lives. Time plus proximity plus imitation leads to a shared resemblance. The more you walk with Jesus, the more you will start to look like Jesus. However, this discipleship principle is also true in regards to the things of this world. One of, the verse, one of these verses that I like in the Old Testament, it's in 2 Kings 17. In 2 Kings 17, God's people are being chastised, rebuked for their idolatry. And here's what it says. It says, they rejected his decrees and the covenant he made with their ancestors, the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols. Listen to this. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. The word worthless there is one of my favorite words in the Hebrew Bible. Um, it's the word hebel in Hebrew. Can you say that with me this morning, church? Say hebel. 
You got to get your phlegm up for it, okay? Chebel. Means worthless, empty. It's like a puff of air. I like to compare it to cotton candy. It, cotton candy, it looks substantial, it looks meaningful, it looks like it's going to satisfy, the, but then you put it in your mouth and what happens? It's gone. It evaporates, right? That's what this word means. Chebel. It says you worshiped Chebel. You worshiped worthless things. You worshiped empty things. And then because you worship those empty things, your life came to look like those empty things. You become like that which you worship. You become like that which you worship. Or if you don't like the word worship, just think of it this way. You become like that which you put at the center of your life. That which you dedicate your time to. That which you invest your life in. That which you spend hours upon hours of, of the day invested in, you start to look like that thing over time. We become like that which we worship. I'll give you a weird illustration for this. Okay, stick with me. Imagine I had a pet parrot. Okay? Imagine I had a pet parrot. But this parrot, I love this parrot so much that I took this parrot everywhere I went. Everywhere I went, the parrot, the parrot went with me, okay? So every, I'm going into a restaurant, got a parrot sitting right there on my shoulder. Getting on the airplane to fly to Denver, parrot comes with me, okay? Everything that I do, every place that I go, the parrot goes with me. Now, after a certain amount of time, what would happen? Here's what would happen. I would start to see my life, wouldn't I? Through the eyes of the parrot. The parrot would always be on my mind. Whenever I'm going to a place, whenever I'm interacting with a person, whenever I'm doing this, doing that, I would always be thinking about, well, how does the, how does my, how does the parrot deal with this situation? So my mind would actually be captured by this pet parrot that I had. That's how idolatry works in our lives. We give our minds over to this thing, whatever this thing is, and after a certain period of time, we become captured by that thing, and we start to see the world through the eyes of that thing, whatever that thing might be. Time plus proximity plus imitation leads to a shared resemblance. So back to my screen time notification. There's no doubt that digital technologies like smartphones have changed the way it means to be human. I've heard it said that these technologies have changed us in such an extent, to such an extent, that Abraham Lincoln would have more in common with the Abraham of the Bible than he would with a college student today. That's how dramatic of a change this technology has introduced into our lives. Digital technologies have changed what it means to be human. It's changed what it means to be human. Sam Lesson, who is a project manager at Facebook, puts it this way. We as a species in the last few decades have gotten three new superpowers. We can literally remember anything... We could talk to anyone on earth instantly for free, and we can process huge amounts of data. Things that human beings have never, ever even dreamed of being able to do, now we just take these things for granted. They're a part of the fabric of our lives. The biggest change might be that this technology now goes everywhere with us. We can't really escape this technology. We go to our phones for everything. My daughter just got her driver's license, like less than a week ago. She just got her driver's license. And I'm trying to tell her, like, she, she doesn't know where anything is, okay? She doesn't know how to get to the gas station a half mile from our house. And she's like, well, Dad, I have my phone. I'm just going to plug it into my phone. My phone will tell. I'm like, no, it's actually good for you to learn how to be lost. It's good for you to learn how to get from point A. Back in my day, back in, you know, Gen X, we knew what it was to be lost, okay? We knew what it was to go to a gas station and ask for directions. Like, that's what we did, okay? But now you never have to be lost. I remember when I turned 16, one of the gifts I got from my parents was the big, like, a Rand McNally road atlas. It was behind, underneath the seat of my, some of you, you know what that was like. Um, now you don't ever have to be lost. 
Now you don't, like, you don't have to carry around a bunch of pictures in your wallet with you. You got your pictures right there on your phone, hundreds of them, thousands of them. You're watching a TV show. You don't know who that actress is. Just get out your phone. Your phone will tell you all, all that you need to know. You, you have an appointment to keep this afternoon. It's all right. Your phone will give you a notification, tell you to keep that appointment. Where should I go to eat tonight? I don't know. I'll get out my phone. My phone will give me some recommendations. Now we go to our phones for everything. We allow our phones to do our thinking for us, our remembering for us. We, we take this technology with us everywhere, just like this pet parrot. And eventually what happens is we start to see our lives through the lens of this technology. The technology completely overwhelms us and reshapes us into its image. We live in an always-on, always-connected world. And it's not just the teenagers that are living in this always-on, always-connected world. It's all of us. Give you some statistics. So teenagers use screen, time, scre screen media rather, an average of 7 hours and 22 minutes every day. By contrast, they read around 29 minutes per day. Now, based on my own teenagers, I think that's very optimistic. Um, teenagers average around one hour and 10 minutes on social media every day. In 2016, half of teenagers felt addicted to their mobile devices. 36% of teenagers wake up to check their device at least once every night. So one out of every three teenagers is waking up in the middle of the night to check their phone. A 2018 study found that 23% of young adults would give up one of their five senses rather than their phone, and 10% would sacrifice one of their fingers instead of their phone. Um, because of this data, parents are understandably alarmed. In one survey that I looked at, parents listed the overuse of technology as their primary concern for their teenage children, well above historical concerns that parents had, like sexual activity, drugs, and alcohol, family background, or breakdown, rather. Now it's technology that is at the forefront of parents' concerns with their kids. Those of us who are parents ourselves have to face the uncomfortable reality that we're not much different than our kids. I know that I'm not. Almost 70% of parents check their phones at least once every hour. Over 50% of teenagers say they often or sometimes find their parent to be distracted by their own cell phone when they're trying to have a conversation with them. You ever had that moment? I feel so small in those moments, just to be honest, where my kids will be trying to have a conversation with dad and dad is busy doing nonsense on his phone. It's a very convicting moment. Now keep in mind, all of these numbers are BC, before COVID. Um, you can, I think, see, put up the next screen. If you want, if you want some statistics on screen time in the post-COVID era, you could get out your device right now and snap that QR code. Uh, that'll take you to a page on the internet with a lot of details breaking this down. But suffice it to say that COVID has put our screen time into a microwave, especially for teenagers. I don't share these numbers to shame anyone, but I do want to shock us to attention. Time plus proximity plus imitation lead to a shared resemblance. There's plenty of evidence that we are being shaped into the likeness of our technology. I'm going to be back at church here 4.30 this afternoon talking about this in much greater detail, about all the different ways that our digital technology is reshaping us into its image. But let me just give you three examples of how the, the, the values of digital technology kind of work against the values of spiritual formation. So you see up here, technology values three things, access, speed, and interruption. That's what your cell phone values. Access, access to anything you want access to, speed. We have no patience at all for a slow connection. We want access, and we want access right now, and also chronic interruption. Or the way I put it with my own kids is, we've forgotten how to be bored. We always have to be interrupted by our technology. On the other hand, spiritual formation values not, not just information, not just access to information, but wisdom. 
Your phone can't give you wisdom. Your, your phone can give you information, but not wisdom. Spiritual formation values patience. Sometimes I worry about a generation that's growing up on Google and how does that affect their prayer life? How does that affect their relationship with God, a God who calls us to wait in faithful patience? Wait? What do you mean, wait? You don't have to wait for anything. Spiritual values, not interruption, but meditation. Quiet, thoughtful meditation. So you have the values of this pet parrot sitting on our shoulders, the values of our technology working against, opposed to the values that really lead to spiritual formation in our lives. So what do we need to do about this? What do we need to do about this? Well, I got a lot of ideas. Uh, some might be better than others. But I know first and foremost, what we need to do about this is we need to think. We need to engage our minds. In Ephesians 1.17, Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so you would know him better. We need dis discernment in how technology is discipling us. Another verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Um, an author named John Dyer, who's written a lot on technology and discipleship, he puts it this way, when technology has distracted us to the point that we no longer examine it, it gains its greatest opportunity to enslave us. We've actually got to think. The first step in working against the discipleship of technology in our lives is actually thinking about how technology is reshaping our lives and then developing strategies on how to rein that influence in. Strategies personally and strategies for our families as well. And the stakes, the stakes are very high. I want that last slide up here. So Barna Research, who does a lot of research on religion, especially Christianity in North America, Barna Research did a study on young disciples, young Christians, high schoolers, college students, um, trying to find the difference between young Christians who persevered in their faith, they call them resilient disciples, and Christians who abandoned their faith, call them ex-Christians or prodigals. They wanted to find out what are some of the differences between those two groups. And this, this book, Faith for Exiles, has a bunch of different ideas to that extent. But one, one question in this book really jarred me. It really surprised me. They asked these, this group of, of uh, young um, former Christians, did you regularly experience help with living wisely when it comes to technology in your church, parish, or faith community? Half of resilient disciples said yes. There were people in my lives, whether it was parents, youth ministers, preachers, we talked about it. We talked about the influence of technology in our lives. We talked about how to live virtuously on social media, how to live virtuously with our smoke. We, we talked about it. Half of resilient disciples said that. Only 8% of those young Christians who abandoned the faith received any instruction on digital technology. This is a huge issue. It's a huge issue not just for us, but it's a huge issue for those who we will disciple, for those who we will train. Um, and so the, the stakes are high. So I'm going to leave you with this. Time plus proximity, plus imitation leads to a shared resemblance. We have this call in our lives to be thoughtful, intentional, and diligent in reflecting on the different ways that things like technology 
are shaping us, maybe shaping us in ways that are against our discipleship of Christ. Take every thought captive and think through the ways that your technology might be counterforming you. And instead, develop strategies to keep technology in its place so that we can grow into the likeness of Christ. Let me pray. God, we thank you for, um, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who work, works in us and shapes us convicts, us, convicts us and challenges us. Lord, I pray that for all of us, we would think um, deeply and carefully about the ways that we're being formed and shaped by all the different forces in this world, especially technology. Lord, train us to take every thought captive and to think well about the influence of technology in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.